Hi, I, I've read some of your speeches and I honestly believe that a lot of what you have to say is true. And, and I, I'm a good person in spite of what my ancestors did. I, I just, I wanted to ask you, what can a white person like myself who isn't prejudiced, what can I do to help you and, and further your cause? Nothing. With everything that we've gone through in this country, particularly black people, we can be proud of where we've come from. And even if you look back, there was a time where if you just looked at our trajectory, how we were going, we had a lot to be proud of. Coming out of slavery and through Reconstruction and through the Jim Crow segregated South, we made a lot of progress. And so when you look at that particular clip that I played from the movie Malcolm X, when the woman asked him, who in her day, I guess would be the equivalent of what you would call a social justice warrior, or I would call a social justice gladiator or someone who is woke. Someone who might be virtue signaling, who wants to maybe feel better for themselves. And, and I don't know, maybe she really wanted to help. But the question she asked was, is there anything I can do to help? And now I'm not a, a big proponent of the teachings of Malcolm X, but what he said to her was absolutely spot on and what ought to be said going forward. Something happened though. He said no, after a while we began to say yes. And I don't mean just yes as though we don't want help, but I mean we shouldn't say yes to any help, to every help, especially if the help is to the detriment of our own responsibility. Today, however, we find black America in some sort of world that I just really don't recognize. I don't really recognize this this new version of black America compared to the way we used to be, the way we were raised with some moral, some sense, some sense of community, the way we looked out after each other. Even if we didn't particularly like each other, we understood that we had a community and that we were somewhat in this together. There's always been forces tearing at, at, at the black community. There's always been racist people and there always will be. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. I found that out in Birmingham. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. So from the Bull Connors to the Governor Wallaces of the South, to all the uh, lynchings of men and women, to all the horrible atrocities that happened to blacks, uh, the burning of bodies, uh, the beatings, the having the dogs sicked on them and the hoses turned on them. We still came through to having the Klan rally in March and to burn crosses and to firebomb homes and churches. We still came through. I don't, know, I don't know how many of you all have ever seen an actual Klan rally or met a person, a Klan's member in his actual hood with a burning cross. I came along at the end of the civil rights movement and it happened to me when we were being bused to an all white school and the Klan, they just simply weren't having it. So we've seen some rough days and compared to how it used to be, not only from my youth, but even from my parents' youth and my grandparents' youth, uh, these are much better days or it seems like they should be much better days for black people. But when you open up the newspaper or you turn on the, the TV or look at the internet, that's not what you see, or at least that's not what you hear. We were people that all we wanted, we didn't want anything from anybody else, just like any other group, just like Asians, just like Hispanics, just like uh, the Irish, Jews, Italians. We weren't people that were looking for someone to give us something. We just wanted people just to move out of the way and let us do for ourselves. And so when someone marched against us having that, we in turn marched back. We weren't uh, trying to stop them from being who they were. We just wanted to be left alone so we can be who we wanted to be, so we can take care of our families, so that we could provide for our families and children. All we had at that time was faith and family, and we were gonna fight to protect all of that. And so we marched, and we protest, and we went to school, and we worked, and we took care of our families. And after time, we began having victories victories in the court systems, victories in the state houses, and so that schools would no longer be segregated so that we could start going to some of these different businesses if we wanted to. And then with that came the, not the right to vote, 
but the opportunity to vote. Now we were able to participate fully in the American dream. Were we at some disadvantages? Sure. But at that time, we really didn't care about the disadvantages we had. We just knew from where we came from and where we seemed to be headed. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. We see the unthinkable. A black man becomes a president. Then we have a black person become a vice president. We've had some things that we can look at and just kind of take some pride and some joy. And I don't care which side of the fence you were politically, but when you saw a black man take the oath of office, that had to do something to you, give you a little bit of pride, whether you were black or white, because America wasn't as bad off as we've been told. But then something happened. Something has been happening. We were people that marched for our freedom. When you saw us together, you knew something positive was happening. But now we've got this. So something has happened in our community. You look at the stats and you see how many black men are murdered. Not at the hands of police, but at the hands of each other. You look at how many blacks are dropping out of school. About 59 to 64% of young black males are actually graduating. You look at how many blacks are committing suicide. You look, at, you look at how many blacks are on their way to jail or already in jail. You look at how many young black men are selling drugs or on drugs. Then you look at how many black babies are being aborted. And well, that should come to no surprise because you look at how many black babies are, who are born are born without daddy being at home. And so because of this devolution of our society, we look and we see uh, the crime scenes on the streets. We see mothers crying because someone has just killed their baby. And in most cases, it's been somebody black who's killed their black child. And then from there, uh, you see a lot of young black men hanging out on the streets, young black men going to prison. The number one cause of death among young black men in America is homicide. And it's gotten to the point to where it's devolved even in our culture. There's this subculture, this dark subculture in the black community that has caused us to devalue women, uh, caused us to devalue life. Uh, even in our entertainment, we see it show up in, these, in the songs that these women sing as they degrade themselves. And even in the videos where the woman is no longer something to be respected, but mainly a receptacle for a man. And it's not so much some racist white person who has written or directed some of these movies, but in many cases, it's somebody black who has written or directed some of these movies that give us the worst image possible. We look like thugs or buffoons. We portray characters uh, that seem to perpetuate every negative stereotype there is about black people. Whatever happened to the days where you would have a group like The Temptations singing a song called My Girl. Now we've got songs singing about this. Man, forget Al Jolson and blackface. We don't need white folks going around making us look bad, putting on blackface and, and, and performing these little step and fetching routines and smiling and dancing and, and making us look like nothing but court gestures and showing off our teeth. We do it just fine by ourselves. All you gotta do is put uh, some chains around our neck, put some gold in our teeth, and we'll play that part just as well as anybody else. And so when you look at some of the things that plague our black community, 72% of our children are born out of wedlock. 64% of all violent crime in America is committed by blacks. 51% of all murders by blacks. Someone once said, and I now concur, that the most dangerous place for a black person to be is one of two places. One, either in a black community where he might get shot or in the womb of a black mother, where almost 50% of pregnancies, like in a place like New York, end in abortion. We have literally lost our souls. And I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna be a little bit troubling. The stats that I'm giving you, the fatherlessness rate, the dropout rate, the crime rate, the rate of drug use, the incarceration rate, uh, the issues when it comes to economics, all these things, as bad as they are, pale in comparison to an even bigger problem that we have in the black community. And for some reason, many of us either don't want to address it or simply want others to be quiet about it. When you see things like that, when you see these negative images, these negative stereotypes, these images of us being thugs or highly sexualized or basically high, high priced clowns, when you see these images, what do you think that does for somebody young and black? 
when they want to look up and see something, what do they see? They see a guy with, in many cases, with a bunch of tattoos, some gold in his mouth and around his neck, uh, with his pants hanging off his behind, uh, disrespecting other black folks, disrespecting uh, those in authority, disrespecting women. What sort of impression should he get? What sort of, what sort of image does he have or she have to aspire to? But not only what sort of image does it send to um, blacks, but you need to ask yourself, what image does it send to whites in America? Remember the stats, we're between 13 to 18% of the population, depending on whose stats you're looking at. It's easy for someone who's not black to go through their daily life and not interact very often with somebody black. And so when they do, and it's just maybe in the course of passing, where do they get their impression of what blacks are like? Television? The internet? YouTube? The courthouse? What? What should they think, what should they believe about black people when they see us behaving, not forced to behave a certain way, but voluntarily acting a certain way? And when they see us in the malls in some place, or they see the crime scenes on the news, how, how do you think they're supposed to react? I don't, know, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Ami Horowitz, but he did a Man on the Street interview, interviewing whites and blacks about what they thought about these so-called voter suppression or these voter ID laws. The whites that were interviewed had a very different view of black people. And when you see it, you kind of get the impression that they don't think too highly of black people. It suppresses the uh, African-American vote? Definitely. Tell, tell us how. Uh, because they're less likely to have state IDs. Minority voters are less likely to have the kinds of IDs that have been um, described or required. These type of people don't live in areas with easy access to DMVs or other places where they can get identification. You can always get IDs um, you do over the internet. Does that also would make it difficult for, for black people in particular? Yeah, you have to have access to the internet. You have to be able to pay an internet service provider for certain fees. Do you think that's harder for black people to go online? Well, IDs? I feel like they don't have the knowledge of how, of like, how it works. A lot of people have smartphones, but you might not have data. For most of the communities, they don't really know what is out there just because they're not aware. or like they're not have access to the internet? We don't know how to, we can't afford the internet and the data. We don't know how to use it. We don't understand how this technology works. Where do they think we live? They have a dim view of us. They look down. Maybe some of you who are aligning yourself with the people who you think are trying to help you, maybe you ought to step back and ask first, what do you think of me? How do you see me? I'm not, I'm not buying into this whole issue of, of this critical race theory and this idea that everybody's racist and so forth. It could be that just many people are just ignorant, but if they're ignorant about the black community, the question is why? Where do they get these, these stereotypes from? Where do they get the belief that we don't know how to do the things that they can do? When we fight about issues such as voter ID laws, that for some reason, a white person can go to the DMV and get an ID, but a black person can't. How many black people do you know that don't have an ID? I know maybe grandma in the, in the 1930s may have had a hard time from uh, coming from rural Georgia or down in the sticks in, in Mississippi or, or, or Tennessee, may have had a hard time getting to the DMV. But this is, this is the 21st century, right? I don't know very many people who don't have an ID or the ability to get one. It makes us look as though we are incompetent, as though we have no idea how to function in the society unless somebody white, somebody benevolent, comes to help us. Many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox. And a fox is, almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to. But the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling. You take him for a friend. Miss Millie, always going on over the cup. Mm. Your children are so clean. Would you like to work for me? Be my maid? <laughs> Miss Millie, right? Uh, if you haven't seen the color purple one, you ought to. Miss Millie is the turn of the century's version of a social justice warrior of today. Someone who's woke in her day. She is extending help to somebody who she thinks is black and incapable of taking care of her family to someone and doggone it you gonna help i'm gonna help you whether you want me to or not if i got to kill you or beat you i'm gonna help you 
And in her case, she's helping because, well, one, she's going to get some benefit out of that. And you need to be careful when you start at, when you start seeing people who want to all of a sudden start helping you. Here's what I never understood. Why would you say that someone is racist and then go to them and ask them for help? Now, I disagree that America is systematically racist. I disagree. Now, I do agree that there are people out there that, that are racist. I do believe there are racist people out there. I do believe that. Uh, I'm just not as concerned about it as most people, I guess. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not focused on it to the degree that I think that someone who believes that, that I am inferior or someone doesn't like me or what have you because of my skin, that that affects me. Everything that I've gotten in life has been a result of me, either good or bad. Going to college, that was me. It had nothing to do with my, with my skin. Of course, I went to go play sports. Uh, building a business, that was me. I didn't get any, any sort of government set aside or anything like that. That was all me. And then, of course, my downfall, that was all me. When you act as though that you need the white person to help you, when you, when you finally make it, guess who gets the credit? And so Oprah's character, Miss Sophia, she gives Miss Millie her answer. She didn't like it, though. Hell no. What did you say? Miss Millie couldn't believe what she said. And that might be what we need to say in many cases. When someone wants to help you get up, the question's got to be why. Is that person that benevolent? It, <clears throat> and I'm not saying that there are no people out there that are benevolent enough and, and that want to uh, help another community or someone else. Why can't the black community do exactly what other communities have done? Blacks from Nigeria have a better standard of living than most whites darker, coming from another part of the world with a language barrier and a cultural barrier, and they seem to do just fine. Blacks from the Caribbean and other parts of the world, when they get here, after one generation, surpass blacks from America. We've been here centuries in this same system, and we struggle, but other folks come here. Why? It's because we've been given something. And this is the part that I want to get into. This is the problem with black America. This is what's happened to black America. They don't come here with an excuse. And they don't have all these years of someone handing an excuse to us. Now we've got white people who are falling over themselves, trying to apologize for what else, making them feel better and hurting us along the way. I take responsibility. I take responsibility. I take responsibility. I take responsibility for every unchecked moment for every time it was easier to ignore than to call it out for what it was. Every not so funny joke. Every blatant injustice, no matter how big or small. Every time I remained silent. Every time I explained away police brutality or turned a blind eye. Black people are being slaughtered in the streets, killed in their own homes. These are our brothers and sisters, our friends, our family. So it makes me ask, while I'm watching, there's a couple things pop up in my head. That is, what black people are they seeing dying on the street? I mean, you heard this narrative, you heard LeBron James saying that we're tired of being hunted by, uh, by police officers. When was the last time you saw some black folks being hunted? I know you watch the news and you see it, but I did a little, a little uh, non-scientific experiment. Name some people that you know personally um, who's been gunned down by the police. Go ahead. We came up with seven or eight names between all of us. And we're talking about an average of 40 years or so. That's not very many. And then when we start naming people that we see on TV, we're probably going to come up with the same 10, 20, 30 people that you see on news, on the news, on CNN, NBC, Fox, and CBS, the same names of someone that's been killed over the last 15, 20 years, right? And the question is not how many people have been killed in the commission of a crime, because if you rob a liquor store, if you're if you're breaking into somebody's house or you, you're, you're selling something that you should and you got a gun. Yeah, good luck to you. <laughs> so I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about uh, uh, Bobby who's knocking over the liquor store. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who was genuinely just out for a stroll and was gunned down by the police officers. Does it happen? Sure. How often? That's the issue. The issue would surprise you when you find out that uh, nine were murdered this past year uh, by police officers versus 19 whites. Well, that doesn't seem to be some, some, some great epidemic, right? 
if you listen to the news, you think that we're being gunned down every day. Well, why is that narrative being pushed? We'll talk about it in just a little bit. But then when you say, I take responsibility, so I shouldn't take responsibility for what happens in my community? So if this guy is selling drugs and goes to jail, it's not his fault. It's your fault. You take responsibility. If this person um, has four children born out of wedlock and daddy's not at home for any of them, yeah, you take responsibility for that too, huh? Uh, if this person isn't doing their homework and drops out of school, you take responsibility for that? How condescending is that? We are done watching them die. I will no longer allow an unchecked moment. I will no longer allow racist, hurtful words, jokes, stereotypes, no matter how big or small, to be uttered in my presence. And so for you to even say that you won't allow it, meaning that you've got the power to stop it, whereas we don't. And I don't have to have His you to sign His and tell me my life matters. That right there insinuates that you think your voice is bigger and better than mine. For one of these, quote, social justice warriors, or they've been called, or social justice gladiators, or someone who's woke, you do think that your voice matters more than the average black person. You must to make that statement, because if I told you I'm going to help you because you need my help, you can't do it on your own, wouldn't you be insulted? And maybe because we've been fed this for the last 50 years, 60 years, maybe the black community has gotten used to this and have gotten numb to this. But that, that's not how we used to be. We've got people who want to feed us something and give us something that they don't want themselves. You all remember the interview that Morgan Freeman had uh, on CBS about, um, <laughs> about Black History Month. You're going to relegate my history to a month? Oh, come well, on. What do oh. you do with yours? What, which month is White History Month? I'm Jewish. Okay. Which I'm month Jewish. is Jewish History Month? Uh, there isn't one. Oh. Oh. Why not? Yeah. Do you want one? No, no. No. I, 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 I don't either. So if you don't want it, why should I? But what's happening is we've got America wanting to patronize and to talk down to us and to pander to us. You've got politicians who want to kneel down in silence um, to pay respect to, to black men who died at the hands of police officers. You've got politicians who want to come to um, black organizations or, or to our community centers or to our churches and talk to us, but they don't want to talk to us any old way. They want to talk to us with some sort of slang the way they think we like to hear it, or the way they think that we sound. Ain't nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with working retail, folding clothes for other people to buy. I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Who are these colored folks sitting there listening to her say this and not rebuking her, not getting up and walking out or not calling her to the carpet? What do they do? They just, they just sit there and clap. That's the problem right there. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump and you ain't black, unchain Wall Street. They're going to put you all back in chains. You've got politicians who think that they know how to speak the lingo and that they have this relationship to where to us where they can talk to us how they want to. What's, what's something that you always carry with you? Hot just sauce. Really? You, yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, listen, I just want you to know people are going to see this and say, okay, she's pandering to black people. <laughs> 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 okay. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't deny it. Her statement was, okay, is it working? Well, apparently it is. Apparently it is because what you now see are people latching on to uh, people on the liberal left. And I'm, not, and I'm not necessarily speaking in terms of political parties. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. But what's happened is not only do we have certain people in certain political parties who want to pander to the black community, we now have blacks doing the exact same thing. And again, 60 years ago, You've had this warning come out from, again, I'm not, I'm not a proponent of Malcolm X's teaching, but he was spot on on this. Today, you could point to a large number of, of Negro leaders who have consistently betrayed 
Negroes in a whole host of areas. They aren't really Negro leaders. These are puppets that have been put in front of the Negro community by white liberals. These are parrots that have been put in front of the Negro community. You've got these people that want to pander to us and talk down to us and kind of pat us on the, on the head while they're giving us something, hoping to gain our loyalty and allegiance. As long as you give them something, he's yours. So you could talk down to a dog as long as you're giving him treats, as long as you feed them, as long as you're patting them on the head, you can keep them loyal to you. You can keep them coming back to you. As a matter of fact, you can keep the dog. As long as you keep feeding him and giving him some treats and, and patting him on the head, he'll stay loyal to you. Well, I'm not the kind of person that wants somebody patting me on the head and feeding me just to get me to be loyal to you. I'm going to be loyal to two things, the truth and God. And what I don't need is for you to give me a pass uh, or my community a pass for bad behavior. I wouldn't give you one. I wouldn't give anyone, anyone a pass for bad behavior. But when you do so, you treat us as though we're the person that we just can't get right. We can't help ourselves. We can't, we can't control our, our actions, our minds, our, our thoughts. It's almost like what was said about the, on the bell curve, that we do need to be graded on a curve, that we can't compete. And so we need you to help us. And you want us, and the reason being so is because if we are helpless, we need someone to come help us. And I refuse, at least I do myself, uh, being a victim of any of this foolishness. And it's gotten so bad that, that these so-called black voices and black leaders have gotten in bed with the, with the liberal left that all they want us to do is to fall right in line and beg at the same trough, the same government trough that they beg at. Why? Because it, think about it, it lines their pockets. You don't see very many of these people, these spokesmen, uh, who, are, who are giving us these excuses, who are giving us a pass for, for this bad behavior in the black community. You don't see very many of them on food stamps. As a matter of fact, you see them doing very well, financially speaking, right? I don't know how many of you have actually seen the interview that Roland Martin did with the King, I think it's King Randall, I can't remember the guy's name, young fellow, uh, 21 year old, who he and I guess some friends uh, were bothered by what was happening in Georgia, in this, in this community in Georgia. So they, they bought a school building and bought a school bus and they're trying to uh, offer a different sort, a different or alternative to the, to the bad education that they're getting in their town in Georgia. And so what Roland, who wants to do is simply pad his pockets, uh, who is beholden to the left, who's beholden to the Democratic Party. Again, I don't have an issue with you being a Democrat or Republican, but you clearly see his motives. Uh, Rather than promoting this young man for doing the right thing, he wants to attack him because he doesn't believe that voting is what's going to get the black community out of the, uh, the position that they're in. Well, newsflash, Roland, that's not. So you don't believe, you don't believe that government, government policymakers play any role whatsoever in being able to impact the lives of black boys and others in Georgia? If we take them out of that government system, we don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. How do you remove someone out of a government system when we all live in government systems? You can do things to take your to remove mo most government from your life. How? As far as trying to get yourself out of food stamps, How? trying to get yourself out of welfare. You got to go work. You got to get jobs. You got to get out here and go and do it. If somebody doesn't have a job, mm -hmm. Are they not applying to government for unemployment benefits or insurance? When I say do for self, you shared one of my tweets, uh, my videos, and I was actually a big fan of yours, but you shared one of my tweets uh, when I said black people need to stop begging the government and go and do for self out in our communities. You shared the video and called me an idiot. I didn't see anything idiotic about that statement No, 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 no. So when you say do for self, like what? Mm -hmm. Explain that. Simply getting up and going out and do it. So I have a question. The stereotype that I'm young, black in America, and I can't do anything because somebody's holding me down. So, Absolutely not. So, a question. Me you, some you... teenagers went and... Go ahead. Me and some teenagers went and bought a school, and we just bought a school bus simply from going out and doing work. We decided to go fix our own communities. I'm not expecting anything from no politician. I'm not... Government plays a role in being able to change the condition of the lives of people. He believes that it's the government's job to get us out of whatever situation we're in, not ourselves. Not like it was in the Indian community or in the Pakistani community or in the Chinese community or in the Jewish community or the Italian community. No, no, we're the only ones who need help from the government. And then it's caused this new breed of white folks who've decided to play into it as well because, hey, you might as well go ahead and get on the gravy train. And you've got these so-called thought leaders. What is his name? Ibrahim X. Kendi. 
Why someone would listen to this foolishness, I don't know. If white people claim they are anti-racist, then they should be asking questions like, why is it that unarmed black people are being killed by police, but, but armed white people are being arrested? Why is there a growing racial wealth gap in this country? If you answer, well, because there's something wrong with black people, then you're answering with a racist idea. It is repackaged garbage that has never worked. But he did say something that was actually true. I'll give him credit for this. First and foremost, not every black person is an expert on racism. Now, this, this is the same black person who is concerned about what's happening to black people and concerned about racism who would attack a judge, Amy Coney Barrett, for adopting black kids who, by the way, he didn't do anything to, uh, to help. He didn't help anybody black. But look at the tweet that he put out about her. Some white colonizers adopted black children. They civilized these savage children in the superior ways of white people using them as props in their uh, lifelong pictures of denial by cutting the biological parents of these children out of the picture of humanity. I don't even know what to say to that other than you, you would be wise to leave him alone. Ignore everything he says. Of course, here's another person who's enriching himself, getting thirty dollars to $40,000 per speaking engagement, having over $10 million donated to his organization by Jeff Bezos. Yeah, I think he's doing fine for himself because he's profiting off of the race industry. And if you look back at Roland Martin's clip, notice what's scrolling at the bottom. He's asking you to give money, to donate money to him. So. There's no secret as to their motives as why they're asking us to be beholden to someone else helping the black community. You want us to, to, to blame everything on racism. You even have people now blaming their obesity on racism. The research says that black women, when we do the same diets as white women, we lose less weight and we lose it slower, even when we're following the diet than our white women counterparts. It's literally that. The racism that you're experiencing and the struggle to make ends meet actually means the diet don't work for you the same. And now we've even gone so far as even saying that some of the things that we know are true, you've got people out there that are saying it's a myth. That's not true. The concept of the absent black father is a myth. It's not real. And then there's been studies that have recently came out that says that like the whole like, black dads aren't involved or whatever. It's just it's, not true. It's just not true. It's yeah. just a myth. You know? yeah. I'm sorry. Which predominantly black neighborhood have you been to where uh, the black fathers are by and large there in full force? I know what you're going to say though. You're going to say that even though they're not married, which by the way makes a difference, even though they're not married, uh, they're still involved. Well, you tell me because you only got 24 hours a day. You tell me how this father who has a child over here and a child over there let's just say only to has two children, how he's involved in both of their lives, though he only has eight hours a day because he's sleeping eight, he's working eight, if he indeed is working, and then he only has eight hours, how he is dividing up those other eight hours, I guess four for this child, four for that child, how is he doing so every day? He has no life of his own, he's not eating, um, he's not working on a love life of his own, I don't know, you tell me how this person is doing that. Stop with the foolishness, call out sin, call out bad behavior so that we can fix it, so we can address it and move forward. So what's the solution? What's the issue here? What do we do to fix this? In 1 Samuel, the people beg and ask for a king. And what does God tell Samuel? He said, don't, don't be upset, don't, don't, don't be bothered. They're not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. And so he tells Samuel, tell them what will happen if you want a government, or in this case, a king um, for your God. He says in verse 10 of chapter 8, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his grounds and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipments for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be for her perfumers, cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. 
and he will take your male servants, your female servants, your, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. Let me drop down to verse 18. <clears throat> and you will cry out in that day because your king, whom you have chosen for yourself, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Obviously, he's referring to, to Israel, but some of that can be gleaned for us because we want, rather than God being God, we rather government to be God. Rather than let God be God and be our source, we want government to be our source. The government can be a resource, but not our source. And the way we made progress prior to the civil rights movement was one, focusing on God. The church was central in our progress as a country. Did we have some times where things were kind of set against us? Did, did we have instances such as Black Wall Street in Tulsa uh, or what happened in Rosewood? Florida? Sure we did. Those things would happen. But you notice those episodes began to decrease as our trajectory went up. The more we became successful, the less you saw these things happening to us. Because what happened was people began to respect our community. What we had gone through was obviously horrible. And no, no community, at least in this country, maybe the, the Native Americans, could say that they'd gone through anything like it. But what we didn't do was we didn't complain about the plight. We instead focused on the future. So we focused one on God, on faith, but also on family. In 1922, 1945, we had 22% uh, of our children born out of wedlock. Now it's 72%. That's devastating to the black community. And so if you ever want to see us to be the community, the group that we have expected to be, the one that we dreamt about during the civil rights movement, uh, we've got to get back to that. So whether it's some new uh, policy or whether it's some new academic theory, none of that is new and none of it works. What was working was those two things, an emphasis and a focus on God the Father and on family. Because what happens is if God is the head of your life, then naturally your heart has changed and the love towards the mother of your children, you marry her and you take care of them. And what we do is this. When you get on an airplane, they say in the event of an emergency, they say first take care of yourself. Put the oxygen mask on yourself and then the person that's next to you. Why? Because if you die, obviously you can't help to resuscitate the next person. You can't help the next person. Same thing in this. Take care of your family first. Take care of home. Let's work inside out. Work on your family. Be the father, if you're a man listening to this, be the father to your children that you're supposed to be. Be the husband to your wife that you're supposed to be. Um, be the person that is the one that your children and your family looks up to. And then let that kind of go out to the, the rest of the community. Let it go from, from your house to your neighbor's house, to your community. And then watch it spread because if we get enough men being at home, like every other community, like the Nigerian community, like the, like the Jewish community, like the Asian community, if we get enough men at home, and we're talking about people who aren't even Christian, but that principle works. If you get enough men at home, you'll start seeing young men and young women going to school and getting their education. You'll start seeing uh, less of a dropout rate, less of a crime rate, less of an incarceration, incarceration rate. You'll see all the negative things that we focus on start dissipating and all the positive things that we look for start increasing. But absent of God, the Bible says that those that wish to build a house, if they do so without God, they what? They labor in vain. This is not a mystery. This is not something new. We don't have to wait on somebody new getting out of college, coming and telling us what's going to work and that how racist we are and so forth, as though they've even seen anything re uh, remotely racist to what we've gone through in our lives and even my parents' lives and my parents' parents' lives and so forth. So let's just be smart about this. Amen.